Well, then I think when it comes down to a pandemic with erratic supply of vaccines globally, it's really important that this type of trial, the Comco V trial in the UK, goes forward to, to really supply the evidence needed for a mix and match strategy. And given that the combination of AstraZeneca with a Pfizer vaccine actually had uh, nine times more uh, production of antibodies, there's a ample evidence to show that there is more of an immunogenic response. This is an actually a very encouraging sign um, for many countries that either have a slow rollout or um, limited supply to access the vaccines, uh, particularly in light of the variants that are circulating. Now, we are seeing South Korea experimenting with mix and match. So is this something that governments around the world should be considering as perhaps a sort of policy or should it be left to personal preferences? Well, I certainly think that uh, it's going to become, it'll come down from uh, a government decision. And, and that is also due to the procurement element of it. Uh, it will definitely de depend on uh, what vaccines are available in your country. Uh, and, and unfortunately, due to vaccine hoarding, that picture looks very different in uh, various countries. So for example, here in the UK, um, there is no uh, change to the plan, despite uh, the fact that we, there is um, an increased uh, protection available, mostly because we've already gone through um, the section of the population that would have been eligible for the AstraZeneca vaccine, but also because, uh, well, yes, we're just focusing now on um, younger populations. So from that perspective, uh, for now, the UK will not be going ahead with the mix and match strategy only because we're so far along in that process that it's really down to um, the members of society who are, are actually not eligible for the AstraZeneca vaccine here. But other countries, if we, you mentioned South Korea, but there's also Germany, Canada, um, based on the, this evidence, who have decided uh, to go forward with uh, this policy now um, for that greater level of, of protection. But on the other hand, uh, in addition to having a higher um, level of uh, efficacy, what we're, we are seeing is a little bit of uh, increase in some mild to moderate side effects. It is also reactogenic. But these are all the typical ones that we would expect to see. Um, so again, uh, so feeling tired, shivers, chills, fatigue, all of these that um, have already been identified uh, with these vaccines can, in some people, feel a bit more pronounced. So going back to the UK study, what does it tell us about uh, these vaccines, in particular Pfizer and AstraZeneca, and how they work? Well, in the sense of how they work, they, they use different mechanisms to essentially instruct the body uh, to create um, antibodies and an immune response. And what we see with the mix and match is that although uh, with the, the Pfizer, Pfizer combination remains sort of the highest in terms of the level of antibodies, what's interesting is also the order in which you give them. So if you give AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccine second, that seems to have yield the best results and a higher T cell response. So it isn't exactly black and white to be able to uh, measure just one element of this. We see that t together, there is an extra kick to the immune system that this mix and match strategy um, provides. Oksana, I want to touch on the global uh, situation for a moment. We are seeing surges across Israel and the UK where you know, vaccination rates are quite high. Is it fair to say that the current vaccines are struggling against the Delta variant of COVID, at least from a transmission point of view? Well, the uh, Delta variant ha is uh, much more um, transmittable. And we see that the exposure, uh, the distance, the time in which one person is in contact with another is actually much less. However, and we are still collecting that data. So I would say this picture continues to evolve. Thus far, it's probably safe to say that the vaccines are still effective against severe disease. So we're talking about preventing hospitalization. There is definitely vaccine escape that is occurring. Uh, due to this variant. So we will continue to see people who've had two doses of the vaccine um, pass away from COVID-19 if they are um, particularly 
elderly or frail or other aspects. There's a wide range of factors at play that will determine that. But on the whole, we could probably at this stage look at it being above 90% uh, ability to prevent hospitalizations against the Delta variant. So two doses, that is still quite high. However, in the UK, we still have uh, and, and actually, I'm one of those people. I've only had one dose of the vaccine, so I'm only 30% um, protected. Although back in December, I was unfortunate enough to catch COVID, so I probably still have some um, uh, immune response naturally. However, so we do see that we're going to have more young people affected, and this is particularly going to be worrying uh, for long COVID in children that you know, we're just still trying to understand. And a lot of studies are ongoing on this, but. Uh, previously, we there were there was an interesting paper in the Lancet about one in three people developing neurological uh, complications. So it, it's a very complex picture, and I think one thing uh, that unfortunately is born out of vaccine hoarding, vaccine inequity, is that these new variants of concern are are inevitable now. We're going to see more of them just as surely as the sun rises the next day. Viruses mutate. We know that, but we've created a type of system where um, only certain people are going to um, be able to um, have uh, full protection and the ability to uh, travel. So uh, it's a complicated picture. And how do you think, is, what, what's the best way to sort of combat uh, the Delta strain, particularly in countries with smaller vaccination rates? You know, Russia, for instance, is saying that the situation has taken a turn for the worse, they are blaming the Delta variant as well. Absolutely. And in this instance, the, the compounding the problem is a high level of anti uh, uh, vaccine hesitancy, anti vaxxer sentiment. So that's going to be an e e even more difficult challenge because here in the UK, we are accelerating on that uh, vaccine rollout. But in other countries, they're going to be much less, much more vulnerable. Uh, towards um, increased hospitalizations and deaths as a result of poor vaccine coverage. And that's almost directly linked to the fact that uh, in this instance, Sputnik uh, V, the, one of the four homegrown vaccines available in Russia, um, recently the WHO has done an evaluation on the, some of the, the facilities, the production plants in which this vaccine has been made. And it came up short essentially in terms of quality of control, manufa good manufacturing practice, so I think that that WHO report uh, requiring uh, further enhancement of quality in developing of those vaccines in Russia, where there was already only two thirds of people, two thirds of people said that they wouldn't get uh, the vaccine. Uh, that recent report from the WHO certainly will not help. Uh, and globally, we need to have a very high vaccine uptake. And, uh, uh, we will find ourselves in a, in a, a sick, a sick <laughs> circular position uh, as a result of the fact that uh, there's just such a inequity in the amount of vaccines people are receiving. So for example, in the UK, we have more than enough for each person. And that might paint a rosy picture for today. And people are very proud of, of their vaccine rollout. But it is part of a problem because it, it, it is generating uh, variants elsewhere in the world. For instance, in Brazil, we see that there's still about 2,000 people dying every day um, just as, from the beginning of the year. So that needs to also be taken into consideration. Okay, Oksana Bizik, uh, great to get your analysis as always. Thanks very much. Thank you.